Chapter Twenty One of Famous Men of Greece. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. C. Y. Famous Men of Greece by John H. Aaron and A. B. Poland. Chapter Twenty One. Lysander. The admiral of the Spartan fleet in the last years of the Peloponnesian War was a man named Lysander. He was brave, but he was also cunning, and frequently gained the victory by laying a trap for his enemy. It is said that he used to tell his officers, When the lion's skin is too short, you must patch it with that of a fox. This was another way of telling them that if they could not succeed by force, they must try cunning. After Alcibiades had been dismissed from the command of the Athenian fleet, a commander named Cannon was appointed to succeed him. Lysander decided to set a trap for him. The two fleets came in sight of each other off the shore of the Hellespont, near a place called Egospotamus, which means Goat's River. One morning at break of day, Lysander drew up his ships in line as though he intended to give battle. Later in the day the Athenians rode toward the Spartans and challenged them to fight but not a Spartan vessel moved. The Athenians concluded from this that the Spartans were either not prepared to fight or were afraid. The next day the challenge was again given by the Athenians, and again the Spartans paid no attention to it. The same thing happened the third day and the fourth. By this time the Athenians felt sure that Lysander was afraid of them. Many, therefore, went on the shore, some in search of provisions, some to take a stroll, some to sleep. Only a small guard was left with the fleet. As soon as Lysander saw that the Athenian ships were unprotected, he rode swiftly to the place where they were lying, and captured nearly the whole fleet. Of one hundred and eighty ships, only about ten escaped. Three or four thousand men were taken prisoners, and all were put to death. One of the vessels that escaped rode directed to the Piraeus to carry the terrible tidings. It arrived at night, and a sadder night was never known in Athens. The news spread through the city. Every house became a house of mourning. Nobody slept. All feared that Lysander would sail into the harbor with his victorious fleet. This was exactly what he did. All the seaports of Athens were blockaded by the Spartan vessels. The wheat supply was cut off, so that the people of the city were soon half starving. The Athenians had now neither army nor fleet. After a three months' siege, during part of which time there was a severe famine, the city surrendered. The only hope of the citizens was that their conquerors might be generous, but in this they were disappointed. The Spartans' terms were hard and cruel. One mile of each of the long walls was to be put down. Athens was to have no larger fleet than twelve ships of war. The Spartans were to name her rulers. To wound the pride of Athens as much as possible, Lysander had the long walls pulled down to the sound of music, and a part of the work was done on the anniversary of the Battle of Salamis, a day always celebrated in Athens in memory of their great victory over the Persians. Thus ended the Peloponnesian War. 404 B.C. It had been a fierce struggle, and all Greece had suffered. Thucydides, who wrote the history of this war, says that never had so many cities been made desolate. Never had there been such scenes of slaughter. Athens was ruined. She had lost her ships and her army, and she was helpless in the hands of Sparta. Thirty men were appointed by the Spartans to govern the city. They are known in history as the Thirty Tyrants. Their rule was very harsh. They allowed only three thousand Athenians to live in Athens. The rest of the people had to leave the city, and Sparta forbade all other Grecian cities to give them refuge. Thebes and Argos, however, boldly defied this cruel order, and many of the banished Athenians went to live in these cities. After eight months the Athenians under a leader named Thrasybulus, overthrew the tyrants, but in that short time no less than fourteen hundred Athenian citizens had been put to death. 
Lysander's capture of Athens made him so popular in Sparta that for some years he was the real head of the government, and he made up his mind to seize the throne. Before he could carry out his plans, however, he was put at the head of a Spartan force and sent to the city of Thebes, against which the Spartans had declared war. His army was routed by the Thebans, and Lysander himself was among the slain. End of chapter 21「of famous men of greece this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by leon meyer famous men of greece by john h harren and a b poland chapter 22 socrates 1 during the Peloponnesian War, a very curious man lived in Athens. His name was Socrates. He must have been the ugliest person in all Greece. His nose was flat, his lips were thick, his eyes were bulging, and his face was like a comic mask. Yet he was one of the best and wisest men that ever lived. His father was a sculptor who carved beautiful figures out of marble, and Socrates, when a boy, helped him and learned the art. When the Spartans sent their armies to burn the farmhouses of Attica and capture cities that were friendly to Athens, many of the young men of the city went forth to fight for their country. Socrates laid down his hammer and chisel and took up a shield and spear instead. He fought in several battles, and Athens had no braver soldier. Once in winter he was ordered to a country called Thrace. It was very cold out, and camping out was not pleasant. However, Socrates bore the cold cheerfully, although he went barefoot, and wore the same clothes that he wore in the warm weather in Athens. After serving as a soldier for several years, he left the army and went home to Athens. Here he became a teacher. He had no schoolhouse. His school was wherever he met persons who were willing to listen to him. It might be in the marketplace, or at the corner of streets. On a hot summer day he would go to the harbor of Athens, and chat with people who were sitting there in the shade, enjoying the cool sea breeze. He talked to the young as well as the old, and often he might be seen with a crowd of children about him. The lessons that he gave were simple talks about the best way of living, or what the Greeks called philosophy. Socrates was very unlike other teachers in Athens, and almost everywhere else for he never made any charge for his teaching. This kept him poor. His clothes were often threadbare and shabby, and so were those of his wife, Xanthippe. He cared nothing for this, but she did, and it is said that she often scolded Socrates because he did nothing to make money, but idled away his time in talking. Once, when he was going out of the house to escape from a severe scolding, she threw a pitcher of water upon him. I have often noticed, Xanthippe, that rain comes after thunder, said the philosopher. No man ever had better friends than had Socrates, but no man ever had worse enemies. Some people disliked him, because he used to ask them questions which they could not answer without admitting that they were very foolish in their way of living. Others said that he was teaching people not to worship Jupiter and Minerva and the other gods of Athens, and that he was misleading the young men of the city. One of his enemies was a poet called Aristophanes, who wrote the most humorous plays that were ever acted in Athens. In one of them, a wild young man is one of the characters, and Socrates is another. Aristophanes made it seem that the teachings of Socrates had caused the young man to become wild. The play did Socrates a great deal of harm, for many people came to believe that he really was advising young men to lead bad lives. Yet one of the worst young men of Athens once said, You think that I have no shame in me, but when I am with Socrates I am ashamed. He has only to speak and my tears flow. Finally, the enemies of Socrates brought against him in the courts the charge of ruining young men and insulting the gods. He was tried and condemned to drink the deadly juice of a plant called hemlock. In Athens, condemned persons were usually put to death by making them drink this poison. 
no man ever behaved more grandly when unjustly condemned to die than did socrates before he left the court he said my judges you go now to your homes i to prison and to death but which of the two is the better lot god only knows it is very likely that death is our greatest blessing generally a person condemned to death had to drink the poison the very next day after his trial but a sacred ship had just sailed from athens to delos this ship carried every year the offerings of the athenians to apollo the chief god of the island and it was a law in athens that no person condemned to die should be put to death while she was on her voyage to and fro so for thirty days socrates was kept in prison during that time his friends were allowed to go see him in the prison he talked to them just as he had done in the marketplace or on the streets some of his friends told him how sorry they were that he should die innocent what said socrates would you have me die guilty on the return of the ship from delos he was told to prepare himself for death he invited his friends to come and be with him at the end he took with them his last meal and was as cheerful during it as if it had been a feast one of his friends asked where he would like them to bury him bury me he said you cannot bury socrates you can bury my body but you cannot put me into a grave he spoke about death and the future life and said that death was only the end of sorrow and the beginning of a nobler life when the jailer came with a cup of poison socrates drank it as cheerfully as if it had been a glass of wine he walked about the cell as he was bidden and then beginning to feel sleepy lay down soon after this he ceased to breathe plato who was one of his pupils says thus died the man who was in death the noblest we have ever known in life the wisest and the best two after the death of socrates b c three ninety nine his work was carried on by his pupil plato who became one of the most famous philosophers of greece his lectures were given in the shade of the trees planted by simon in the academy years before besides great philosophers athens had some famous painters two of the most celebrated were zeuxis and paragius who lived about four hundred b c they were rivals once they gave an exhibition of their paintings zeuxis exhibited a bunch of grapes which had such a natural look that birds came and pecked at them the people exclaimed astonishing what can be finer than zeuxis's grapes zeuxis proudly turned to his rival's picture a purple curtain hung before it draw aside your curtain paragius he said and let us look at your picture the artist smiled but did not move someone else stepped toward the curtain to draw it aside and it was then discovered that the curtain was part of the painting i yield said zeuxis it is easy to see who is the better artist i have deceived birds paragius has deceived an artist it is said that zeuxis died laughing at a funny picture that he had painted of an old woman end of chapter twenty two Chapter twenty three of Famous Men of Greece. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. Famous Men of Greece by John H. Haran and A. B. Poland. Chapter twenty three. Xenophon. One. One day, as Socrates was walking through a narrow street in Athens, he met a young man who was remarkably handsome. Socrates stretched out his staff so that the young man had to stop. "'Where can bread be found?' asked the philosopher. The young man's manner was modest and pleasing as he told Socrates where to buy bread. "'And where can wine be found?' asked the philosopher. With the same pleasant manner the young man told Socrates where to get wine. 
and where can the good and the noble be found? asked the philosopher. The young man was puzzled and unable to answer. Follow me and learn, said the philosopher. The young man obeyed, and from that time forward was the pupil and friend of Socrates. He was called Xenophon, a name that afterward became famous among the Greeks. The king of Persia at that time was Artaxerxes. He had a younger brother named Cyrus, who was the governor of some provinces in Asia Minor which belonged to Persia. Cyrus thought that he had a better right to the throne than Artaxerxes, and he determined to seize it. The Persians had helped the Spartans in the Peloponnesian War, and Cyrus had found out what splendid fighters the Greeks were. He knew also that many of them had become so used to fighting that they did not like a life of peace, and were willing to fight for anyone who would pay them. He decided, therefore, to get the Greeks to help him to fight for the throne of Persia, and he sent to several Greek states to invite the soldiers to join him, promising them great rewards if he succeeded. Xenophon had a friend who was going with Cyrus, and who advised Xenophon to go too. Xenophon talked the matter over with Socrates, who told him to ask the oracle at Delphi what to do. So Xenophon went to Delphi, but as he had made up his mind to go on the expedition, he did not ask the oracle whether he should go or not. He only asked to what gods he should sacrifice before he set out. After sacrificing as the oracle advised, he started for Sardis in Asia Minor, and reached that city just in time to join the expedition. Eleven thousand Greeks from different states had entered the service of Cyrus, so that with his Persian forces a hundred thousand strong, he had an army of a hundred and eleven thousand men. Xenophon was not a general or even a soldier in this army. He seems to have gone with his friend, hoping that some opening would be made for him. There was a magnificent road from Sardis to Susa, Artaxerxes' capital, but even upon the best of roads an army of a hundred thousand men, most of whom were on foot, had to move slowly. Cyrus's troops went about fifteen miles a day, and it took them six months to reach a place called Cunaxa, about seventy miles from Babylon. Here they found Artaxerxes at the head of an army of nearly a million men. The troops of the Persian king advanced with a great shout, thinking that the noise made by thousands of men shouting would terrify the Greeks. But the Greeks only raised their war-cry, Victory! and steadily advanced, overcoming everything that was opposed to them. Unfortunately, Cyrus went into the battle himself at the head of his Persian forces. Seeing his brother, he rushed forward, exclaiming, I see the man, and wounded Artaxerxes with the javelin. He himself, however, was quickly killed by the soldiers of Artaxerxes. As soon as their leader had fallen, Cyrus's Persian soldiers lost heart and fled. 2. The Greeks were now in a terrible plight. They were six months' march from Sardis, and opposed by an army a hundred times the size of their own. In the battle of Cunaxa they had so thoroughly beaten the Persians that Artaxerxes and his men were afraid of them, and decided to get rid of them by treachery. The Persian commander-in-chief, Tissaphernes, therefore invited the Greek generals to a friendly meeting, and promised to furnish them guides and provisions so that they might return safely to Greece. The generals, never suspecting foul play, went to the Persian camp. There they were all put to death. The Greeks were now greatly alarmed. The night following the assassination of the generals was one of terror. Not a fire was lit, even for the cooking of the supper. All slept with arms at their sides, while the sentries listened to catch the slightest sound. Xenophon spent the night in thinking what was best to do. It was clear to him that someone must be chosen by the Greeks as their leader, and that they all must stand by one another. He felt sure that if this were done there would be a good chance of getting home safely. In the morning he told his thoughts and hopes to others of the Greeks, who were greatly cheered by what he said. Although he had held no office in the army before, he was now made one of its generals. The shortest way to get out of the kingdom of Persia was to go to the Euxine, now called the Black Sea, 
which lay many hundred miles to the north beyond rugged mountains. At one of the ports on the shore of that sea the Greeks hoped to find ships in which they might sail to Greece. The march was at once begun. All sorts of hardships were met with. There were snowstorms and bitter north winds. It was sometimes hard to get enough food. The mountain tribes, through whose land the army had to march, were often unfriendly, and rolled rocks down the mountain slopes upon the soldiers. At last, however, the shores of the Euxine were reached. The Greeks, since the murder of their generals, had marched for five months in an enemy's territory. They had drawn supplies from the country, and had lost but few of their men. The retreat was in fact a victory. Xenophon returned to Greece, but he did not go back to Athens. During some of the time that he had followed a soldier's fortune, he had fought with the Spartans against Athens, and the Athenians had passed a sentence of exile against him. He went to Sparta, and soon afterwards settled on an estate in Elis. Xenophon's farm is still pointed out to visitors to Greece. He passed about twenty years quietly in hunting, writing, and entertaining his friends with stories of his life as a soldier on faraway battlefields. From notes which he made, he wrote a history called the Anabasis, or March Up, which is an account of Cyrus's march up to Babylon, and of the retreat of the Greeks. Owing to political troubles, Xenophon finally had to leave his pleasant home in Elis. He went to Corinth, where it is supposed that he died. End of chapter 23《Four of Famous Men of Greece》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. C. Y.《Famous Men of Greece》by John H. Aaron and A. B. Poland Chapter 24 Epaminondas and Pelopidas Part 1 In the city of Thebes, no long after the Peloponnesian War, lived two young men whose names were Pelopidas and Epaminondas. Pelopidas was rich, Epaminondas was poor. Both were fond of athletics and manly sports, but Epaminondas found his chief pleasure in books. Both were brave men and true, and they loved each other like brothers. Once, when their city was an ally of Sparta, they were sent by Thebes as soldiers to help the Spartans in a war with their neighbors, the Arcadians. The young men were fighting side by side when their comrades gave way and fled. Closing their shields together, they bravely held their ground and tried to drive back the Arcadians. Pelopidas was wounded and fell. Epaminondas would not desert his friend. Although badly wounded, he held the Arcadians in check until help came and he and Pelopidas were rescued. In time Sparta became jealous of Thebes and tried to take away the liberty of their people. A few rich Thebans were willing to help Sparta do this in order that they might be made the rulers. One day they led a band of Spartan soldiers, who happened to be passing into Cadmia. This was the rocky citadel of Thebes, which rose above the city as did the Acropolis at Athens. The Cadmia had never been captured, but on that day the garrison was taking a holiday, for the citadel had been given up to the women, who were celebrating a festival of Ceres in it. So the Spartans easily took possession of it, and having once got it, they held it for four years. During that time the men who had betrayed the citadel into the hands of the Spartans ruled Thebes as tyrants. They put some of the Thebans to death and banished others. Over three hundred were sent away. Among them was Pelopidas. Epaminondas was so poor that the tyrants did not think him of any consequence if he was allowed to stay in Thebes. He used his influence to get the young Thebans to drill in order to make themselves superior to the Spartans in skill and strength. Part 2 The exiles went to Athens. After living there for a few years, Pelopidas determined to free his country, and he easily persuaded the other exiles and some Athenians to join in carrying out his plans. When everything was ready, the exiles left Athens. Twelve of them volunteered to get into Thebes and kill the tyrants. They disguised themselves as hunters, divided into four parties, and taking hounds with them, hunted through the fields around Thebes. As dusk came on, they made their way into the city. 
It was a cold winter day. Snow was beginning to fall, and very few people were in the streets. So the exiles reached the house where all were to meet without being noticed. Twenty-six citizens joined them, and all remained in the one house until near midnight. A patriot who was in the plot had invited the tyrants to supper at his house. At the supper wine was served, and the tyrants drank freely. After the supper some of the patriots, dressed as women, were admitted to the banquet hall. As soon as they entered the room, the guests greeted them warmly, but the supposed women at once threw off their veils, drew their swords, and killed the tyrants. Pelopidas, with another party, went to the houses of two of the tyrants, who had refused the invitation to supper, and after a fight killed them. The patriots then went from house to house, calling on all the people to defend their homes. The Spartan soldiers in the Cadmia heard the noise and saw the lights, but were afraid to come out. In the morning the other exiles with their friends from Athens came into the city, and all the citizens rose up in arms. The Spartan garrison gave up the Cadmia, and Thebes was free. Part three. Sparta waited eight years before a chance came to punish the Thebans. Then war was declared, and an army of ten thousand Spartans marched against Thebes. The Thebans also raised an army, and through the influence of Pelopidas, Epaminondas was elected one of the chief captains. Pelopidas himself was captain of a famous sacred band of three hundred young men who had taken an oath to give their lives in defense of liberty. The two armies met near a town called Leutra. There Epaminondas gained a great victory, although his army was less than half as large as that of the Spartans. Epaminondas and Pelopidas drilled the men of Thebes so that they were the best soldiers in all Greece, and Thebes helped other Greek cities become independent. Pelopidas went to Thessaly, to weigh the people of that state against the tyrant who was trying to rule all Thessaly. The army of Pelopidas was not nearly so large as that of the tyrant, but Pelopidas was victorious. Unfortunately, however, he was killed in the battle. The Thessalians begged the Thebans to allow them to bury the hero, and their request was granted. Part four. The death of Pelopidas was a sad blow to Pernondas. However, he did not let his grief stand in the way of duty. Athens at this time had grown jealous of Thebes, and had united with Sparta. So the armies of the two cities met the Thebans under Epaminondas in the year 362 B.C. Near the town of Mantinia, where a long and fierce battle was fought. At length the Thebans were victorious, and the Spartans were driven from the field. The victory, however, was dearly bought. Just when the tide of battle was turning, and the Spartan ranks were breaking, Epaminondas received a wound in the breast from a spear. The shaft broke, and the head remained fixed in the wound. Epaminondas was told by his physician that he would die as soon as the spearhead was removed. Those about him wept, and one lamented that he was dying without a child to keep his name alive. Luke try and Mantinia, replied the hero, our daughters will keep my name alive. When he was told that the victory was secure, he cried, I have lived long enough, and with his own hand drew the spearhead from his breast. Thus passed away a man who stands out in Grecian history as a spotless hero, a soldier who never fought except for freedom, a man who lived only to do good. End of chapter 24「Chapter twenty five of Famous Men of Greece. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. Famous Men of Greece by John H. Harn and A. B. Poland. Chapter twenty five. Philip of Macedonia. One. After the death of Epaminondas. Thebes soon lost the high place she had gained among the states of Greece. For a while no state held that place. Sparta was never powerful after her defeats at Leuctra and Mantinea, and although Athens had rebuilt her long walls, she was not the strong power that she had once been. A state, partly Greek and partly barbarian, lying far to the north, suddenly took the lead in the affairs of Greece. It was Macedonia. The king of Macedonia had a brother named Philip, 
who had spent a part of his youth in Thebes. He had seen Thebes become the greatest of Grecian states through the bravery and military skill of Epaminondas, and he determined to make his own state great. The chance came to carry out his determination. The king of Macedonia was assassinated, and the brother who succeeded him was slain in battle. Philip's infant nephew was heir to the throne, and Philip became the guardian of the little king. In a short time the claims of his nephew had been set aside, and Philip was on the throne of Macedonia. Not long after he became king, Philip was married to Olympus, a proud and beautiful woman, daughter of the king of Epirus. Philip had seen her for the first time at a feast of the god of wine. She and her maidens were dancing among garlands of vines and flowers. On the head of Olympias was an ivy crown, and in her hand a staff, twined with a wine branch. As she danced, her wild beauty won the heart of Philip. He asked her hand in marriage, and she became his wife. Philip soon showed that he was a wise ruler. He treated his people with fairness, and they became very fond of him. One day, after he had been drinking, he was acting as a judge and gave a decision against a woman. His sentence seemed so unfair to her that she thought he was under the influence of liquor. I appeal, she cried. I am the king to whom you do your appeal, asked Philip. I appeal from Philip drunk to Philip sober, she replied. The next day Philip considered her case again and decided in her favor. 2. It was, however, his skill as a soldier that most endeared Philip to his people. He knew that the Spartans had become the masters of Greece because every Spartan was a trained soldier, and he knew that Epaminondas had won his great battles because of the way in which he had arranged his men. Philip, therefore, had his army carefully drilled, and in battle he arranged his soldiers in his famous phalanx. This phalanx consisted of a mass of men, sixteen deep. If there were sixteen thousand men, the front rank had one thousand standing side by side. Three feet behind these stood a second rank of thousand. Behind the second rank stood a third line of thousand equally close and so on until there was a solid body of men sixteen deep and a thousand wide. Every man bore a round shield, about two feet in diameter, and a spike or spear, twenty-one feet long. The shields were buckled to the left arm, and were held to close together. Before them bristled the spear points like a hedge. Against these spear points neither men nor horses could advance, and the charge of the phalanx broke down everything before it. Athens and Thebes were finally aroused to action against Philip by the eloquence of Demosthenes, the great orator, who was constantly sounding a warning. An army was sent to oppose the Macedonian. Philip met this army at Chironea, not far from Thebes, and there gained a great victory. This put an end to the power of Athens and Thebes, and made Philip master of all the states of Greece except Sparta. But Philip was wise and fair enough not to become a tyrant. He knew the history of Sparta. The military training of the Spartans had made them strong. Their tyranny had made them weak. For no state of Greece was ever content to remain under Spartan rule. Philip, therefore, acted generously towards the conquered states. He let each manage its own affairs, while a general council, like our Congress, managed matters in which all were concerned. The first thing that Philip proposed to the Council of the States was that all Greece should make war against Persia. The members of the Council were delighted, and Philip was invited to be the commander-in-chief of the expedition. Preparations for the invasion of Persia had already begun, when Philip's career was suddenly ended by an assassin, who, at a wedding feast, plunged a sword into the body of the king and killed him. End of the chapter 25Chapter twenty six of Famous Men of the Greece. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. 
Famous Men of Greece by John H. Harn and A. B. Poland. Chapter Twenty Six. Alexander the Great. One. Alexander, the son of Philip of Macedonia and Olympias, was born on the same night that the great temple of Diana at Ephesus in Asia Minor was burned. It is said that while the temple was burning, soothsayers ran up and down the streets of Ephesus, crying out that the night had brought forth sad disaster to Asia. This was true of the birth of Alexander as well as of the burning of the temple. Alexander was educated chiefly by the famous Greek philosopher Aristotle. The young prince was an earnest pupil. It is said that he could recite the Iliad of Homer from beginning to end. He excelled also in athletic sports. The horses of Thessaly, a state of Greece adjoining Macedonia, were famed for their speed and spirit. While Alexander was still a boy, a fine Thessalonian horse was offered to his father at a very high price. Philip wished to have the animal tried, but the horse was so wild that everyone was afraid of him. Philip was about to send him away when Alexander offered to ride him. The king gave his permission. Alexander had noticed that the animal was afraid of his own shadow. He therefore seized the plunging horse and turned his head toward the sun, so that his shadow fell behind him. Then patting his neck and speaking gently to him, he leaped upon his back and soon completely tamed him. The head of the horse was supposed to have some likeness of that of an ox, so he was called Bucephalus, or ox head. He became Alexander's favorite horse and carried his master through many a march and many a battle. Alexander's ambition was shown at an early age. While he was yet a mere boy, he made up his mind to conquer the world, and when he learned from Aristotle that there were many other worlds in the universe, he was greatly saddened by the thought that he had not yet conquered one. As Philip went on making one conquest after another, Alexander became alarmed. Why, he cried one day, my father will leave nothing for me to do. However, when he became king, he found enough to do. First of all, there were other claimants to the throne besides himself. Some of them Alexander put to death. Others fled the country. He learned that Thebes and other Greek states were thinking of throwing off the Macedonian yoke. He therefore gathered a large army and marched to Thebes at the head of it. The Thebans were over aved and submitted to him without resistance. The Athenians, in spite of Demosthenes' advice, sent a messenger to him while he was at Thebes, offering their submission. A little later the Greeks met in general council at Corinth, and gave him, as they had given Philip, the command of the expedition that was to be undertaken against Persia. Sparta alone refused to agree in the vote. Alexander returned to Macedonia and marched against some Thracian tribes in the northern part of his dominions. While he was subduing them, a report of his death reached Greece, and Thebes again took up arms. Suddenly Alexander appeared in Greece with his victorious army. He took Thebes by assault, and pulled to the ground every building in the city, except the house once occupied by the famous poet Pindar. Six thousand of the inhabitants were put to death. A few escaped by flight, and the rest were sold as slaves. 2. Alexander now began to prepare for the great expedition against Persia, which had so long been planned. Soon his army was ready to march. It consisted of less than 35,000 men, but with these he boldly crossed the Hellespont. He landed on the Asiatic coast, not far from the site of ancient Troy. From the plain of Troy he marched to the river Granicus, on the bank of which he fought his first battle with the Persians. The Persian army was completely routed, and its commander killed himself rather than face the disgrace of his defeat. The great city of Sardis, the stronghold of the Persians in western Asia Minor, now opened its gates to the conqueror. The following spring Alexander advanced into the province of Phrygia. In a temple of the city of Gordium was kept the chariot of Gordius, once a famous Phrygian king. The yoke of the chariot was fastened to the pole by a knot of tough fiber. The knot was said to have been tied by Gordius himself. It was very puzzling. 
An oracle had declared that whoever should untie it would become the master of Asia. Instead of trying to untie it, Alexander cut it with one stroke of his sword. The people of Asia Minor took this as an omen that he was to be their master, and offered him but little resistance. Beyond the mountains in southeastern Asia Minor, the great king, Darius, was waiting for the Greeks with an enormous army. He became impatient and crossed the mountains into Cilicia. A battle was fought at Issus, but the Persians were no match for the Greeks. The battle ended with overwhelming defeat to the army of Darius, and he fled from the battlefield. He left not only his baggage and treasure, but his wife and mother and children, all of whom fell into Alexander's hands. These captives were treated with much respect and kindness by the conqueror. Soon after the battle at Issus, Damascus was captured. Alexander then moved against Tyre, a famous port of Syria, whose trade was with every land and whose merchants were princes. So great were the resources of the city that it withstood a siege of seven months, but at the end of that time it fell into Alexander's hand, and thirty thousand of its citizens were captured and made slaves. From Tyre, Alexander marched toward Egypt. On the way he passed through the Holy Land. When he reached Jerusalem, he was met by a friendly procession of priests and Levites, who came out from the gates of the city, with the high priest at their head, to bid the conqueror welcome. Egypt, like the Holy Land, was won without a battle. The people were weary of Persian rule. In Egypt, Alexander did one of his wisest acts. He founded a city near the mouth of the Nile to be a great trading port. It is still called Alexandria after its founder. Another wise act on Alexander's part was to invite the Jews to settle in his new city. He saw that they were wonderful traders, and, as he expected, they made Alexandria a greater commercial city than Tyre. In the spring of the year 331 B.C., Alexander again set out in pursuit of Darius, who had now collected another large army. In October, not far from a place called Arbela in Persia, the forces of Darius and Alexander met in their last great battle. Darius had done everything he could to ensure the defeat of the Greeks. His army was said to number a million men. One division of it had two hundred chariots, to the wheels of which skiths were attached. The skiths went round with the wheels and were expected to mow down the Greeks like grass. In another division of the army were fifteen trained elephants that were intended to rush wildly among the Greeks and trample them down. But the skies armed chariots, the elephants, and the million men were alike unsuccessful. The vast host was completely routed, and Darius turned his chariot and fled. From Arbela Alexander pushed on to Babylon, whose brazen gates were thrown open to him. Susa, another great city of the empire, surrendered without resistance. Then, to make his conquest complete, he marched on to Persepolis, the magnificent capital of Persia proper. This city, with its immense treasure of silver and gold, fell into his hands. Five thousand camels and ten thousand mule carts carried away the spoils, the value of which is said to have been $150 million. Alexander pursued Darius, but before he overtook him, the great king was murdered by one of his own satraps. Alexander had the body buried with royal honors and punished the satrap with death. The empire of Persia now lay at Alexander's feet, and the work for which the expedition had set out was finished. The young king, however, had no desire to return to Macedonia. He had conquered the east, but the east had also conquered him. He had become a slave to its ways of living. His old simple Macedonian tastes had been laid aside, and his life was given up to pleasure. 3. Soon, however, he undertook another conquest, and at the head of his veteran soldiers advanced eastward into Bactria, and added this province to his dominions. Amongst the Bactrian captives was a beautiful princess named Roxana, who became his bride. Southeast of Persia lay India, a vast empire rich in gold and diamonds. 
Alexander desired to add it to his conquests. Great mountain ranges enclose India on the north and northwest. Crossing these are passes, through which travelers from Central Asia must go to reach India. Alexander went by the way of Khyber Pass, and marched steadily onward till he reached the river Hydaspes. Here an Indian king, named Porus, engaged him in battle. Porus proved to be the most desperate fighter Alexander had met with in all Asia. When the Indian was at length overpowered and captured and brought before the conqueror, Alexander asked him how he expected to be treated. "'Like a king,' replied Porus. "'That you certainly shall be,' said Alexander. And so he was, for it was the habit of Alexander to treat honorably all whom he conquered. On the bank of the river Hydaspes, Alexander had the misfortune to lose his horse Bucephalus. At the place where the animal died, the conqueror founded a city, which he named Bucephala, in honor of his favorite. The conqueror was not able to go on with his Indian campaign. His soldiers were worn out with marching and fighting, and insisted that they would go no farther, and so, much against his will, Alexander was obliged to lead them back to Persia. The return march was one of great hardship. At the mouth of the Indus, Alexander sent the fleet to sail along the coast and up the Persian Gulf, while he led the land forces towards Susa and Babylon. The army had to march through a country which was hot, dry, and barren. The men suffered dreadfully, and Alexander shared their sufferings. Shortly after reaching Babylon, he was attacked by a fever, which he had not the strength to resist. Around his deathbed were gathered his generals. They asked him whom he wished to succeed him. He drew his signet ring from his finger and handed it to Perdiccas with the words, To the strongest. A little later he had ceased to breathe. Thus passed away one of the greatest soldiers the world has ever known. At the time of his death, 323 B.C., he was only 32 years old. His victories had been won and his conquests had been made in the short space of 12 years. End of the chapter 26「Chapter 27 of Famous Men of Greece」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Men of Greece by John Heron and A. B. Poland Chapter 27 Demosthenes Roman numeral 1 In the city of Athens, about 25 years after the Peloponnesian War, there lived a delicate boy named Demosthenes. His father was a manufacturer of swords and made a great deal of money. But when Demosthenes was only seven years old, his father died. Guardians had charge of his property for ten years. They robbed the boy of part of his fortune and managed the rest so badly that Demosthenes could not go to school to the best teachers in Athens because he had not money enough to pay them. One day, when he was sixteen years old, a great trial was going on at Athens and he strolled into the court. There were fifteen hundred and one die-casts, or, as we call them, jurymen, in their seats and the court was crowded with citizens who, like Demosthenes, had gone in from curiosity. A lawyer named Callistratus was speaking. He did not finish his speech for nearly four hours, but no one left the court until he ceased to speak. Then hundreds of people went out and hurried home. Demosthenes waited to see the end. When each of the jurymen had thrown a voting pebble into a basket, the clerk of the court counted the pebbles and told the result. Callistratus had won the case. Demosthenes went home determined to become a lawyer and public speaker. In one year from that time, he brought suit against his guardians, delivered four orations against them, and won his case. 
He recovered a large part of the property which his father had left to his mother and himself. After this, he entered public life, but the first time he made a speech in the public assembly, it was a complete failure. He stammered and could not speak loud enough, and in trying to do so, he made odd faces. People laughed at him, and even his friends told him that he could never be a speaker. So he went home greatly cast down. Then an actor who was a great friend of his family went to see him and encouraged him. He asked Demosthenes to read to him some passages of poetry. Then the actor recited the same passages. The verses now seemed to have new meaning and beauty. The actor pronounced the words as if he felt them. The tones of his voice were clear and pleasant, and his gestures were graceful. Demosthenes was charmed. You can learn to speak just as well as I do, said the actor, if you are willing to work patiently. Do not be discouraged, but conquer your difficulties. I will, said Demosthenes, and he did. It is said that to improve his voice he spoke with stones in his mouth, and to become accustomed to the noise and confusion of the public assembly, he went to the seashore and recited there amid the roar of the waves. To overcome his habit of lifting one shoulder above the other, he suspended a sword so that the point would prick his shoulder as he raised it. He built an underground room in which he could study without interruption and practice speaking without disturbing anyone. He had one side of his head shaved so that he would be ashamed to leave this retreat. Then he remained there for months at a time engaged in study. One thing that he did while there was to copy eight times the speeches in the famous history of Thucydides. This was to teach him to use the most fitting language. Besides all this, he took lessons of an excellent speaker named Isius, who taught declamation. In this way, the awkward boy who had been laughed out of the assembly became in time the greatest orator of Athens. Not only was Demosthenes a graceful orator, but he was wise and patriotic. He soon acquired great influence in Athens and became one of the ten official orators. At this time, Philip of Macedon had organized a strong army and was beginning those conquests which in the end made him master of Greece. Demosthenes, from the first, regarded him with suspicion, but said nothing until convinced that Philip was threatening the liberty of Athens and of all Greece. Then he urged the Athenians to fight against Philip as their forefathers had fought against the Persians at Marathon, at Salamis, and at Plataea. Philip, he said, is weak because he is selfish and unjust. He is strong only because he is energetic. Let us be equally energetic, and being unselfish and just, we shall triumph. Philip's victory at Chaeronea completely disheartened the Athenians, and Demosthenes had to use all the power of his eloquence to rouse them. In his speeches, he showed how the success of Philip and the failure of Athens were not due to the advisers of the people, or to the generals who led their army, but to the Athenians themselves. You idle away your time, said he, going into barbers' shops and asking what news today, while Philip is gathering forces with which to crush you and the rest of Greece with you. Philip tried to bribe Demosthenes, but the orator was absolutely incorruptible, and to the end of his life he raised his voice and used his influence for the cause of freedom against both Philip and Alexander. He delivered twelve orations on this subject. Three of these orations were specially directed against Philip and are known as the Philippics. They are so bitter in their denunciation of Philip that today any speech which is very bitter and severe against a man or a party is called a Philippic. The most famous speech that Demosthenes ever made was in defense of himself and is known as the speech on the crown. He had advised the Athenians to unite with the Thebans against Philip. His advice was followed and a victory was won. The Athenians were so much pleased that it was proposed to crown Demosthenes with a golden wreath at one of the great festivals. Now this proposal had to be voted on by the people, and some of Demosthenes' enemies objected. If the people refused to vote the crown, it would have meant disgrace for Demosthenes, 
and so he was obliged to go before the assembly to speak in defense of himself, and to show that his advice to his countrymen had been correct. It was true that the Athenians had not been able to destroy Philip's power, or free the states of Greece from his control. But, said Demosthenes, I insist that even if it had been known beforehand to all the world that Philip would succeed and that we should fail, not even then ought Athens to have taken any other course if she had any regard for her own glory or for her past or for the ages to come. By this he meant that it was the duty of her people to fight for what they believed to be right, even if in the very beginning they had known that they could not succeed. Grander words than these never fell from human lips, and when the vote was taken, the people decided that he should receive the crown. Roman numeral two. When news reached Athens of the murder of Philip, Demosthenes rejoiced and placed a wreath upon his head, as if he were at a feast. He even persuaded the Athenians to make a thank offering to their gods. Alexander soon placed the Greek cities at his mercy. Then he demanded that Demosthenes and eight other Athenian orators should be delivered up to be punished for treason. Demosthenes told the people of Athens the story of the wolf and the sheep. Once on a time, he said, the shepherds agreed with the wolf that henceforth they should be friends. The wolf promised faithfully never again to attack the sheep, but he said he thought it would be only fair that the shepherds should cease to keep dogs. The shepherds agreed and gave up their dogs. Then the wolf ate up the sheep. The Athenians knew what Demosthenes meant and heeded the lesson. They kept their watchdogs, Demosthenes and the other orators, safely at home. Alexander at length withdrew his demand and treated the Athenians with kindness. However, this did not win the favor of Demosthenes, who continued to oppose the Macedonians at every step. After some years, one of Alexander's satraps stole a large treasure, fled to Athens, and begged for protection. Demosthenes was unjustly accused of helping him and was condemned to pay a fine. He could not pay it and so went into exile. When Alexander died, the orator returned to Athens. The Athenians sent a man of war to bring him to the Piraeus. The magistrates, the priests, and all the citizens marched out to welcome him and escort him to the city. Demosthenes now made a last effort to free Athens, but Macedonia was still strong, and Athens and those who loved her were weak. In a short time the demand was again made that the orators be given up to be punished, and Demosthenes again had to flee for his life. He sought refuge in a temple of Poseidon on an island near the coast of Greece. The sacredness of the temple ought to have protected him, but he was not allowed to escape. The captain of the soldiers who were sent to kill him told him that if he would come out of the temple he should be pardoned. Demosthenes knew well that this promise would be broken. He asked to be allowed a few moments in which to write a letter, and his request was granted. He wrote, and then placed the end of his writing quill in his mouth. Those who were watching saw him grow pale. He tried to reach the door, but fell dead near the altar. He had taken poison which he had long carried in the end of his writing quill, for he feared that if he ever fell into the hands of the Macedonians, he would die in prison or by torture. End of chapter 27「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「」「
After Alexander became king, Aristotle went to Athens and established a school of philosophy. His fame grew, and he was called the Man of Wisdom. He spent much of his time in writing, and wrote about almost everything that men thought of in his time. Some of his works are studied in our colleges today. Like all other great men of Greece, Aristotle had enemies. Some of them accused him of not having respect for the gods. He therefore fled from Athens, in order, as he said, to keep the Athenians from sinning against philosophy by banishing him. He died in exile. It is said that for about two hundred years after his death, people did not know what had become of his writings. The men to whom they were left had buried them in an underground chamber, for fear the king of Pergamos, who was very proud of his library, would get hold of them. When the manuscripts were at last found, they could still be read. For hundreds of years after that, Aristotle's writings were more widely studied in Europe than almost any other books. 2. Another great philosopher who lived during the time of Alexander was Zeno. He was born in Cyprus, but came to Athens in his youth. He gave his lectures in a porch, called in Greek a stoa, from which he and his followers are called Stoics. He taught that men should live simply, and learn to be neither fond of pleasure nor cast down by sorrow. Today we call people Stoics, who endure pain and misfortune without complaining. One of Zeno's rivals was a philosopher named Epicurus. He founded a school in Athens, and taught there for thirty-six years. His enemies accused him of teaching that pleasure was the only thing to live for, and many people still have this idea. We call a man an epicure who is very fond of high living. Epicurus, however, really used the word pleasure to mean peace of mind, not the mere satisfaction of eating and drinking. Both he and his pupils lived in a very simple way. One of the oddest of Greek philosophers was Diogenes. He used to stand in the public places of the city and ridicule the follies of his fellow citizens. Because of this habit, he and his disciples were called cynics, or growlers, from a Greek word which means dog. It is said that he lived in a tub. Many stories are told of the curious doings and sayings of Diogenes. Once, in broad daylight, he walked through the streets of Athens carrying a lighted lantern. "'What are you about now, Diogenes?' asked one man who met him. "'I am looking for a man.' sneered Diogenes. Once, when he was on a voyage, the ship in which he was sailing was captured by pirates. The passengers and crew were taken to Crete and sold as slaves. The auctioneer who was selling them asked Diogenes what he could do. "'I can rule men,' was the answer. "'Sell me to someone who wishes a master.' When the great council of the states of Greece honoured Alexander by asking him to lead their forces against Persia, the young conqueror visited Diogenes. The philosopher was then living at Corinth, in the house of the man who had bought him as a slave. He was in the garden, basking in the sun, when Alexander visited him. "'Can I do anything to help you, Diogenes?' asked Alexander. "'Nothing but get out of my sunshine,' replied Diogenes." As Alexander was leaving this man of few wants, he said, If I were not Alexander, I should wish to be Diogenes. It was as though he had said, If I were not going to conquer the world, I should like to have the power which Diogenes has to conquer self. 3. A number of celebrated painters lived during the reign of Alexander. The most famous was Apelles. Alexander would allow no one else to paint his portrait. Apelles had talent, but he became a great artist as much by his patient industry as by his talent. His motto was, Never a day without a line. Once he painted a horse, and exhibited it in a contest with some of his rivals, who also had painted pictures of horses. He saw that the judges were not going to give the prize to his picture, so he requested that all the pictures should be shown to some horses. This was done, and the animals paid no more attention to the pictures of Apelles' rivals 
than they would have paid to blank boards. But when Apelli's horse was shown to them, they neighed as though they had seen a friend. End of chapter 28「Chapter twenty nine of Famous Men of Greece. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. Famous Men of Greece by John H. Harn and A. B. Poland. Chapter twenty nine. Ptolemy. One of Alexander's favorite generals was Ptolemy. In the division of the empire Egypt was placed in his charge. Other parts of the empire were entrusted to other generals. One had Macedonia, another Thrace, another Syria. At first they ruled as governors for Alexander's young son, but after a while they became independent and were called kings. Ptolemy and his descendants ruled Egypt for more than 350 years. They were a great line of sovereigns, and did much for the good of the country. We are accustomed to think of them as Egyptians, but really they were Greeks living in Egypt. One of Ptolemy's first acts, and one which shows that he was a man of affectionate feeling, was to bring the body of Alexander from Babylon to Egypt. It was first buried in Memphis, but afterwards removed to Alexandria, because, as you remember, the city was founded by Alexander, and named after him. Ptolemy made Alexandria his capital, and did a great deal to beautify the city. He founded a museum and began collecting books for a library. His son, Ptolemy Philadelphus, carried on his work and made the library the largest and best in the world. Most of the books were made of the pith of the papyrus, or paper plant, of which you have read in the story of Pisistratus. They were written in Greek and Latin. Ptolemy appreciated the intelligence and learning of the Jews, and treated them with so much kindness, and gave them so many liberties, that great numbers of them settled in Egypt. Two things that Ptolemy Philadelphus did are especially worth remembering. One was to cause the Bible of the Jews to be translated into Greek, the other was to open again a great canal which had been dug many centuries before from the Nile to the Red Sea, but had long been filled up by the drifting sand of the desert. This was something like the cutting of the Suez Canal. Ptolemy's canal connected the Atlantic with the Indian Ocean. Ships could sail from the Atlantic across the Mediterranean, then through the canal and the Red Sea, and on to India. At that time Egypt raised more wheat than any other country in the world, so she had a great commerce. In exchange for her wheat she bought the products of Europe and Asia, and Alexandria became the richest city of the world. But more than that, the Ptolemies, especially Philadelphus, invited learned men to their court and gave them support so that they might carry on their own studies and teach others. At one time there were 14,000 students receiving instruction in the city. Thus Alexandria became the home of learning. It was there that pupils were first taught that the earth is round, and one of the great astronomers who lived there found out very nearly the length of the earth's circumference and diameter. The people of Alexandria knew more about these things 200 years before Christ than the people of Europe did a thousand years after. The science of today, about which you hear so much, is only the continuation of what was begun by the wonderful Greeks, whom the Ptolemies gathered about them in Alexandria. One of the Ptolemy line was the celebrated Cleopatra, an able ruler, and the most fascinating woman of her time. You will read something of her history in Famous Men of Rome, a companion volume to this book. End of the chapter 29「Chapter 30 of Famous Men of the Greece This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. Famous Men of Greece by John H. Harn and A. B. Poland. Chapter 30. Pyrrhus. A prince named Pyrrhus lived in the state of Epirus, not far from the home of the great Achilles. At twelve years of age he became king, but the government was carried on for him by guardians. About that time he read the story of Alexander the Great, and determined to be like him, a great conqueror. While he was dreaming of victories in foreign lands, war came to him in his own country, and he was driven from Epirus. Ptolemy of Egypt helped him to defeat his enemies and regain his throne. Then he resolved anew to conquer as Alexander had conquered, and he began with Alexander's own Macedonia. After a war that lasted several years, he got possession of one half the country. One of Alexander's generals took the other half. However, the people in Pyrrhus half preferred the old general as a ruler, and in seven months Pyrrhus had to give up his Macedonian kingdom. He reigned quietly in Epirus for a few years. Then a chance came to try and conquer the Romans who lived just across the Adriatic Sea. Pyrrhus was delighted. Ruling Epirus was a dull business. In the south of Italy a great many Greeks had settled. Greek was the language of the people who lived there, and the region was called Great Greece. Rome wished to rule all Italy, but those Greeks were not willing to be under Roman rule. So they sent word to Pyrrhus that they were in trouble and would like him to help them. Preparations for war were at once made, and as soon as possible, Pyrrhus landed on the shores of Italy with an army of about 30,000 men and 20 elephants. A great battle was fought, and Pyrrhus won the victory, but the loss of life was dreadful. As he walked among the dead after the battle, he said, Another such victory, and I shall have to go home alone. Half his men were slain. However, the Greeks of South Italy furnished him with fresh soldiers, and he gained a second victory. The war came to an end in a very curious way. One of the servants of Pyrrhus deserted to the Romans and offered to poison his master for the consuls. The consuls sent back the deserter to Pyrrhus under guard and with a message that they scorned to gain a victory through treason. Pyrrhus, to show his gratitude, then sent back to Rome all the prisoners whom he held, without asking any ransom. This made the enemy's friends, and a truce was concluded. It was one of the terms of the truce that Pyrrhus should leave Italy. A large number of Greeks lived in Sicily. They had built Syracuse and other large cities and towns. At that time Carthage in Africa was a powerful city, and the Carthaginians were trying to conquer the Sicilian Greeks. Pyrrhus crossed to Sicily to help his countrymen. But his Italian friends got into trouble with the Romans again, and begged him once more to help them. Accordingly, he left Sicily and went back to Italy. Now, however, his good fortune forsook him. He was totally defeated by the Romans under Curius Dentatus, and forced to leave Italy. He now returned to Epirus, but as he was no lover of peace, he soon went to war a second time with Macedonia. Again he conquered the land of Alexander, but again the king of Macedonia regained the kingdom. Not content to rule Epirus, Pyrrhus next went into the Peloponnesus, and fought against the Spartans, but they drove him from their territory. Finally he went to Argos, and took part in a civil war which was going on in that state. A fight took place in one of the streets of Argos, and during it a woman threw a tile from the roof of her house. It took Pyrrhus upon the head and stunned him, and some of the soldiers of the party against whom he was fighting ran up and killed him. 287 B.C. 2. Sicily, about whose struggle with the Carthaginians you have just read, was the home of a famous mathematician named Archimedes. He was born at Syracuse in 287 B.C., and was only a boy when Pyrrhus was in Sicily helping the Carthaginians fight the Sicilians. Many years later, Syracuse was besieged by another enemy, the Romans. Archimedes, then an old man, proved of great help to his countrymen. He invented engines for throwing stones at the enemy. 
By using these engines the Sicilians kept the Romans at bay for a long time. It is said that Archimedes set fire to the Roman ships with powerful burning glasses. At last, however, Syracuse fell, and Archimedes was put to death by a Roman soldier, contrary to the order of the Roman commander. End of the chapter 13「Famous Men of Greece」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine « Famous Men of Greece » by John H. Harn and A. B. Paul. Chapter 31 – Cleomenes the Third. About a hundred years after the death of Alexander the Great, lived a young prince named Cleomenes. His father was one of the kings of Sparta, and bore the name of one of the greatest of Greek her heroes, Leonidas, the famous defender of Thermophilae. One day, when the prince was about eighteen years old, he started from home to go hunting. He had not gone far from the city gate when one of his father's slaves overtook him and handed to him a writing tablet. On its waxed surface Cleomenes read the words, Leonidas, the king, to Cleomenes. Come back to the palace the moment you have read this note. Cleomenes turned and went back towards the city. Late in the afternoon he reached the palace. The gateway was hung with a garland of flowers, and entering he found the woman busily arranging roses and lilies in every room. As soon as he saw his father, he asked, Is anyone going to be married? "'You are,' replied his father. "'This evening I wish you to marry Agiatis, the widow of King Agis. "'I am having the palace decorated for the wedding. "'She is beautiful and good, and the heiress of one of the richest men in Sparta.' "'But,' said Cleomenes, "'how can she ever be willing to marry your son?' "'I am the king,' replied Leonidas, "'and she is bound to obey me.' "'Since you wish it, I will marry her,' said Cleomenes. "'but I never can hope that she will love me.' "'Cleomenes had good reason for saying this, "'for Leonidas had caused his fellow king, Agis, "'the husband of Agiatis, to be murdered. "'Agis had been one of the best and greatest of Sparta's kings. "'He had been distressed at the state of his country "'when he came to the throne. "'The old customs of Lycurgus had been set aside. "'Since the close of the Peloponnesian War, "'when Sparta had proved more than a match for Athens, a great change had come over the kingdom. Her men were no longer warriors. The hope of Agis was that he might persuade the people to live according to the old laws, which no one now obeyed. But Leonidas, his fellow king, did not wish to return to the old ways of living, and the five ephors, or magistrates of Sparta, were friends of his. They determined to put Agis to death. The ephors seized him upon the street and carried him to prison, and— for no other reason than that he had tried to carry out the laws of Lycurgus and restore the glory of Sparta, he was put to death. This had been done at the orders of Leonidas. Cleomenes therefore had reason to think that Agiatis never would marry him. However, the marriage took place as Leonidas wished, and although Agiatis hated Leonidas, who had murdered her husband, she soon learned to love Cleomenes who was manly and true, and who devoted his life to making her happy. She talked to him of Agis, and what he had wished to do for Sparta. As Cleomenes listened, he made up his mind to do just what Agis had wished to do. He saw that luxurious ways of living had weakened Sparta, and destroyed her influence. And he saw also that his father's friends were not the few good and brave men still left in Sparta but rich men who cared for nothing but money and pleasure. 2. Leonidas died a few years after the murder of Agis, and then Cleomenes became king. At this time a great general named Aratus was at the head of the league of Greek cities called the Achaean League. It seemed likely that it would soon control all the Peloponnesus. Cleomenes therefore persuaded the Spartans to go to war against the Achaeans. In several battles he defeated Aratus and won for himself great fame as a soldier. 
This made the Spartans very fond of him, and he thought that the time had arrived when he might persuade them to obey once more the old laws and customs. But the efforts were opposed to the changes which he wished to make, and so he boldly put them to death. Next day he banished eighty citizens who were opposed to his plans. He then explained to the people why he had done this, and why he had put the efforts to death. If without bloodshed, he said, I could have driven from Sparta luxury and extravagance, debts and usury, the riches of the few and the poverty of the many, I should have thought myself the happiest of kings. He declared that the laws of Lycurgus must be enforced, and the land be again divided among the citizens. The people were delighted when they heard all this, and much more were they pleased when Cleomenes and his father-in-law were the first to give up their lands for division. The rest of the citizens did the same, and so, six hundred years after Lycurgus, there was a new division of property, and once more every Spartan had land enough to raise wheat and oil and wine for his family for a year. Again the citizens dined at public tables on simple Spartan fare, and the youths were trained and drilled as Lycurgus had ordered. The Pyrrhic dance, which trained soldiers in quick movements, was revived. Again the army was well disciplined, and the soldiers of Sparta became, as long ago, the best among the Greeks. The king himself set his people an example of simple living. Some of the Greeks had laughed when Cleomenes said he would tread in the steps of Lycurgus and Solon, but when they saw Sparta victorious on the battlefield and the city prosperous and happy once more, they could not help admiring the man who had brought the change about. But in time a dreadful disaster befell Cleomenes and Sparta. The Achaean League invited the Macedonian king Antigonus to bring an army to help them against Cleomenes, and in a single battle the Spartans lost almost everything that they had gained. The other king, who was Cleomenes' own brother, was killed, and out of six thousand men whom he commanded only two hundred survived. Cleomenes made his way to Sparta, and advised the citizens to submit to the Macedonians, which they did, and the independence of Sparta was gone forever. Cleomenes had hopes of getting help from Ptolemy, king of Egypt, so he sailed to that country, and he was promised assistance. But, unfortunately, Ptolemy died, and the next king made Cleomenes a prisoner, because an enemy of the great Spartan had said that he was plotting against the Egyptian king. Cleomenes saw no way of escape, and so put an end to his life. He was one of the greatest men of the last days of Greece. End of the chapter 31「Famous Men of Greece」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. Famous Men of Greece by John H. Harn and A. B. Poland. Chapter 32 The Fall of Greece the states of Greece tried again and again to throw off the Macedonian yoke. Unfortunately, however, they often quarreled with one another and were not ununited against Macedonia. For this reason the kings of that state kept their place as masters of Greece for another hundred years. Then the Romans invaded the country and in a battle fought near a town called Pydna, the Macedonians were defeated and their king Perseus was taken prisoner. This brought the Macedonian kingdom to an end. Macedonia was made part of the Roman Empire, and men were sent from Rome to rule it. Epirus was next captured. A hundred and fifty thousand of its inhabitants were sold into slavery, and the state was made a Roman province. After the fall of Macedonia, the other states of Greece still continued fighting with one another. So, in about twenty years, B.C., 146, a Roman army was sent against them. A battle was fought near Corinth, in which the Greeks were completely defeated. Corinth, at that time, was one of the richest and most beautiful cities in the world. 
After the battle the Roman general let his soldiers enter the houses and take what they pleased. Pictures, marble statues, and jewelry were taken and shipped to Rome. It is said that two of the rough Roman soldiers played a game of dice on one of the finest pictures. So little did they value works of art. Two thousand of the men of Corinth were put to death by the Romans, and the women and children were made slaves. After the buildings of the city had been plundered, they were set on fire. And now Athens, Thebes, Sparta, and other Greek states became, like Macedonia, parts of the empire of Rome. From the rule of Rome, Greece passed, in the Middle Ages, under the rule of Turkey, and it was only about seventy-five years ago that she revolted from Turkey and became once more an independent country. If ever you go to Greece, as thousands of people do, to visit the places where her great men lived, you will see little but ruins. The columns of the temples are broken, the stones of their walls lie scattered on the ground. And yet Greece, even amid ruin and decay, is still teaching the world. Many of the words that stand for branches of learning in our language today are Greek words. Such words are arithmetic and mathematics. They show plainly that the first teachers of mathematics in Europe were Greeks. Gymnasium and athletics are also Greek words. They show that the Greeks set as the example of running races, wrestling, jumping, throwing quoits, and doing other such things to make our bodies strong. Poet, too, and poem are Greek, and remind us that the Greeks taught us how to write poetry. Grammar, rhetoric, and geography are Greek words. So are logic, astronomy, and surgery. These and hundreds of other words in daily use show how much we have inherited from the Greeks. Although the old-time glory of Greece has waned, the light of art and science which she kindled in the world grows brighter as time rolls on. End of the chapter 32 And End of the Famous Men of Greece by John H. Harn and A. B. Poland